Into the Atlantic depths, ships, allied and neutral alike, continue to plunge. And finally, America reached the end of her patience. Soberly, with full realization of the meaning of her action, America went to war against Germany. For the first time, but not for the last, American soldiers marched off to fight in a European war. And it wasn't a moment too soon. In the high Alps, the Italian forces were fighting and falling back before the heavy blows of the Austrians. Enough of everything. But when everything, every gun, every shell, every tin of food had to be manhandled up the slopes and under conditions like these, it was small wonder that sometimes even the bravest Italian soldier wavered. The Western Front wasn't the only place where a two-to-one chance was the soldier's lot. But on the Western Front, at least, there were signs of a turn in the tide. The new machines and pilots of the Royal Flying Corps had gone into action with encouraging results. With things on a more equal footing, the Allied airmen proved themselves as good as the German, and often better. front, German plane after German plane fell out of the sky. German pilots tasted the bitter cup of defeat. Meanwhile, in Russia, for the Allies, things had taken a turn for the worse. Dissatisfied with the Kerensky regime, the workers listened more and more to the overtures of Lenin and his Bolsheviks. And this time, when eruption took place, it was on the ships instead of in the army. At Petrograd's naval base of Kronstadt in October 17, the crews turned against authority and set in motion the 10 days revolt that shook the world. The days of sunset for the old Russia. Protected by the fleet's guns, the workers in a night attack stormed the winter palace of Petrograd. When dawn came, the world found that a way of life had passed into history forever. And in its place was something new, significant, and formidable. But even while Russian soldiers were marching out of the war, others were marching in. The American doughboy entered the struggle with all the zeal with which he enters into most things he thinks worth doing. He listened to the recruiting speeches, he signed up and he drilled as though life itself depended upon him. Even the women straightway formed their own force. Believing right on their side, the Americans set about their task with all the drive of their pioneering forefathers and with American efficiency and organization. Enough of everything went without saying. But before America's great power could be applied, the Battle of the Seas had to be won. The Atlantic, over which her troops would have to pass. Already the introduction of the convoy system had cut Allied losses to a fraction of what they had been a few months before. And now there was reinforcement in shipping from another source. In American harbors, Warships mounted guard over German ships caught by the declaration of war tied up against American piers. In some cases, the German crews had scuttled and went ashore with the satisfaction that their ships could no longer sail for anybody. But by and large, the American entry into the war gave the Allies a good haul of captured enemy vessels with which to help beat the U-boat blockade. Meanwhile, over the Atlantic waters sailed new American submarine chasers. Blimps and aircraft sought the elusive U-boats from the sky. And from this new viewpoint, even the tiny wake set up by a periscope could be detected. The Battle of the Atlantic had become a case of the biter bit.
crowds at a French port cheered the arrival of General Pershing, the American commander-in-chief, the Germans could no longer boast that no American soldier would ever set foot on the soil of Europe. For now the first was setting foot, and so were thousands more of his fellow countrymen. For the first time in history, the stars and stripes were seen over the green countryside of France. Vive la France! and vive les Américains. In the front lines, Tommy Atkins and his French amis drank a toast to their new ally and a quick end to the war. With the backing of a great industrial nation like the United States, enough of everything needed to win could now only be a question of time. Enough for tomorrow. Today, the British and French must still depend upon the likes of Aunt Maud. And of course, Aunt Maud was not to be found wanting. But now to build up must be the maxim. Not just enough to hold on, but enough to attack and overcome. Enough for victory, to put the world right once and for all. To put the world right. But already the world, though we didn't realize it, was another place. Already in Russia, the Tsar had been murdered and in his place were people not just on the same level as God, but seemingly above him. Already in Russia, the lowest were the highest, even though they might not be quite ready for it. But for Britain, well, as Mrs. Higgins, his husband, used to say, Storm Buckingham Palace? Well, I mean to say, King George wouldn't like it, would he? No. But don't think we don't have our own revolutions. And just as frightening for some of us, look at them. Look at them. In 1917, what the world was going to be like after the war, Mrs. Higgins' husband just shuddered to think. Yeah.